Thanks, Will and Ben. Hey, let's express our appreciation for these guys being here today and leading us in worship. Man, sounds great. Really appreciate it. I mean, serving is a big part of what it's about as far as lifting up Christ. Um, these guys have taken time to prepare to glorify the Lord today. I understand the uh, youth and company got back from Puerto Rico, right? Right, right. Went well. All right. We'll learn more later, undoubtedly, but I saw a lot of what you're doing is what, putting a roof on a building that had been really messed up by the hurricane, no doubt. So, cool, cool. I like, there was one uh, picture, I don't know if y'all saw it, but it's on Facebook, roof muscles, roof muscles, and these guys, you know, this kind of thing. So, you guys apparently work out. So, uh, even Doug Plummer looked pretty good. <laughs> and that sounds weird, but uh, anyway, okay. Hey, I want to reiterate what uh, Shannon was doing. First of all, stepping in, you know, I know Shannon has a broken collarbone, so let's be in prayer about continued healing. She stepped in today to do announcements, but also Shannon and, um, and a few others who, I won't try to name them all, but they kind of coordinate the mission ministry efforts here, the idea, and I think we understand this. It's not so this seven or eight people just do it all. They try to coordinate so that we can be in mission to the community, nationally, places like Redbird, internationally. In fact, we have Patty Grasty is going with a group down to Columbia again, leaving this Wednesday. So be in prayer for that crew. I'm going to go down and pray with them in Batavia after this service. But I uh, want to just kind of reiterate, this, sat this coming Saturday morning, we have an opportunity to put in place what we talk about a lot. And that is to, um, to just demonstrate to the community what the love of Christ is is all about. So we're gonna be what, fixing playground? I mean, there's just a whole list of things that was in the insert in your bulletin. Basically, I just want to really encourage slash urge you to be a part of this gathering this coming Saturday morning, to take three, four, five hours Saturday morning, come together, we'll have some breakfast, be, enjoy a big group together, and then some are doing some things here, some are going out to, I think, fix a playground, to do some house projects, and do some other things in the community. So uh, just to appreciate those who are organizing it. Let's Let's show up, let's sign up and then show up and be a part of that ministry. Uh, let's see, so yeah, we're, we're praying for Shannon, continuing healing in her collarbone. I got a text yesterday. You, you probably won't recognize these names, but I just wanna be faithful. Um, a lady in our church, Rosa Singleton, she usually attends the 8.30 service. She texted me asking if we would pray for her dad. Her dad's name is Bob Schaefer. He used to go here, I guess, years ago, but it, it was just discovered he has a cancerous brain tumor and he's having a surgery on Wednesday. And you, you can imagine how serious it is. They said without surgery, I uh, gave him like six to eight weeks. With surgery, maybe, depending on the surgery, maybe nine months. And so this is just really uh, kind of uh, devastating for the family. So this Wednesday, pray for Bob Schaefer. Pray for Bob Schaefer. One of the cool things, Rosa told me that his surgeon, I don't remember the name, but his surgeon is a, is a believer, is a Christian, and the surgeon talked about how, what did he say? Something like, from God's voice to my hands. And I just think it's just cool when a person with incredible, you know, surgical abilities, I mean, just one example of many, but gives glory to God. So we're thankful for that. Also, I know Jan Stevens is having surgery this Friday as well for a disc thing on her back. So let's be a people of prayer, people of service, people of action. Today's the last, uh, the fourth of a four-part series. We've been going through the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. He wrote this from a prison. Uh, you know, the scholars debate, we don't have much information on what the prison was like. We think Paul's imprisonment in Rome around the year 60 AD was kind of a house prison thing that he actually had some pretty decent relationships uh, in, in, the, in the Roman Empire, but nonetheless, he was imprisoned, he couldn't go anywhere, and he wrote this letter to a church that he'd spent three years at, and kind of gives them an overview of, here's the things God's calling me to tell you to keep in mind as you face the stuff of life. And he wraps it up today in Ephesians 6 um, by basically saying, be strong in the Lord. And certainly that's a message that you and I is relevant to our lives today as we live life, go down that road of life, be strong in the Lord. So we're gonna be looking at, um, I did put it on the uversion.com app, 
Laura Gregg was on vacation, so I last night uh, dug into the app and, whew, man, I, I'm not a technological dinosaur, but I'm, I'm uh, not far from that. But I, but I got it and got the outline on the app, so it's there as well. And we're going to be looking at the putting on the armor of God uh, throughout the message rather than reading a paragraph right now. So I'll tell you what, let's pause, let's pray, let's ask God to bless this time. Let's pray. Oh, actually, real quick comment before I pray. Um, you know, it's interesting, when you, I find, when I speak of the topic of spiritual warfare, weird things happen. They just do. And I remind myself, Jesus has authority over all. In fact, we're going to look at a verse. Greater is he, Jesus, who is in me, than he who is in the world. Because, you know, when weird stuff happens, you think, eh, it's coincidence, whatever it might be. But in, I don't know, I've been using an iPad now for... Well, probably about 12 years preaching from an iPad rather than paper. Last service, I'm preaching about spiritual warfare, about you know us having the power of the Holy Spirit to be victorious against uh, the, the demonic. And my iPad starts just going wacky. And it wouldn't, I'd go like this and it wouldn't move. And all of a sudden, boop, shuts off. I'm like, hmm, hmm. So um, it was at the end of the sermon, so I'm thankful for that. But um, I just, I don't believe this kind of stuff's um, coincidental. And, and so we just acknowledge, well, let's pray as we acknowledge it. God, as we come to you today, we acknowledge that indeed Jesus Christ has authority over all. He is victorious. He was victorious over death itself as he laid in a tomb and then three days later arose alive. And so Jesus is the pathway to victory. And so, Lord, whatever happens today, this morning, here at this time, we know that we are more than conquerors in you. And we receive the authority you extend to us for the kingdom of light and goodness to be expanded over the kingdom of darkness. And so we just proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of all. And we entrust this time to you, Lord, and entrust that whatever happens, it will be, as we glorify you, it will be for that which is good and right according to your holy name and your holy word. Jesus, we pray this in your holy name and give you thanks. It's an honor to be a part of your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Amen. All right, the big idea of today's message is that we as Christians are living uh, spiritual among, warfare, among, that God is calling you individually, you individually, and you and I collectively as a church body to be equipped and prepared to defeat evil and to make disciples for Jesus Christ. And so the application point leads, you know, comes right from that. Obviously, as a follower of Jesus, God's calling you and I to put on the armor of God, and we're going to talk about what that is, to prevail over evil and make disciples for Jesus. And so Paul, as he's kind of wrapping up this letter, says, finally, finally, it's like, it's like he's got these whole, this whole list of things. I want you to remember this, be aware of this. And, and then he says, finally, it's like sometimes, sometimes on Fridays or Saturdays, Friday's kind of my, sort of my day off, and Saturday is Saturday. And so I'll do a kind of self-imposed uh, list. I'll say, okay, this, here's, here's what I'm looking at today, you know. I try to get the work stuff before the play stuff. So I got a vacuum today. I was instructed to uh, empty the dishwasher, so I'll be faithful about that. Um, got to remember to transfer the clothes from the washer to the dryer, or else it doesn't work out well. Um, <laughs> Let's see, what else? Vacuuming's not so hard today. Vacuuming now is I go over to this little round thing and I go, do, 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 and it just starts going all over the place, driving our dogs crazy, and it vacuums uh, my, somebody gave us that in our family, so it's kind of a handy deal. And we got, it's like the Jetsons. We got this little square thing that does our mopping in the kitchen. You know, do, 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 away you go. Spray, wash, wash, spray, wash, wash. And uh, I'm like, wow, who would have thought in this day and age? Um, so I do all that, and then at the end, I got to remember, finally, finally, remember around 4.45, 5 o'clock, turn the oven on to 400 degrees, because it takes a while for ovens to heat up, and if, 
And, and if you're instructed this and you don't do it, it delays things. And, and so uh, finally, make sure you get done what you're supposed to do. So Paul is saying, finally, um, here, here's the main deal. But let, let's go back a little bit and just hit on the highlight of what he's told us. Because he was telling the church in Ephesus, but he's telling the church in Bethany too, these things. First thing he says is, I want, want you all to remember, God is architect of the entire universe. He's created the entire universe. But that being said, he knows you personally. He designed you personally with the, the gifts and abilities and talents uh, and, and wants you to be in relationship with him and others. So that's kind of the first thing. Remember that. Secondly, he says in Ephesians, it's by grace you have been saved, right? It's by God's grace, not of our own works. Why is that? So that we won't boast about it. But God says, I love you. So I'm pouring myself into you, giving you my son, Jesus Christ, so that you can experience salvation and then do the things that I've designed you to do as part of Jesus' church. So by grace you've been saved. Then in chapter 3, he says, be empowered to live by the Holy Spirit. You've received the grace of the gift of Jesus Christ for salvation. Now receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. i got stuff for you to do in this world, and it's not easy, and you're going to need the power that I can give you. And then he kind of brings it around in chapter 4 and says, now remember, the truth is in Jesus. The truth is in Jesus. People have lots of opinions. You have opinions. Other people have opinions. We all have opinions. Where's the truth? The truth is found in Jesus. And he says, speak the truth to your neighbor. Speak the truth to your neighbor. And you know, sometimes that easy, that, that's easy. Love one another. Love God. But sometimes that gets a, a little more challenging when things get controversial. Well, what's the truth? Well, the truth's found in Jesus and his word. And then he says, uh, wrapping up the end of verse of chapter four, so it's kind of like, I mean, it's like today's stuff. Speak the truth. And he says, but be kind to one another. Because sometimes if we're not careful, we'll say, well, here's the truth. Here's what God's word has said. But he says, but, but as you do that, be kind to one another. Ephesians 4, 32. Then he gets into chapter five and he shares some other things that are significant in living for Jesus. He says, refrain from sexual immorality. That was an issue then, it's an issue today. Lots of possibilities for sexual immorality. He says, refrain from those things. Don't do that. God's designed sex as a special gift between husband and wife. Remember that, keep it that way. Refrain from sexual immorality. And then he goes into what the marriage covenant is about. Husbands love your wives. Wives, you know, be subject to your husbands, but uh, respect one another. And then he goes to the nat kind of the natural segue is children and parents. Children, obey your parents. Children, obey your parents. Great. Speaking the truth in love, right? But then he included parents. Parents, love your children. Don't exasperate them, right? Don't exasperate them. Right, as in children that can relate to parents, right? All right. Let's, let's, um, parents, don't exasperate your children. And he's wrapping it up in chapter 6. We're almost to today's specific passage where he then says, and he talks about bond servants and masters. And I know it was a culture there today, right? We, the Bible does not promote slavery, right? Can we, we're clear on that. I assume we're clear on that. But there were bond servants, people that got into debt, and to pay off their debt, they, they worked as you know, indentured servants to pay off their debt. And he's saying, whether you're a servant or you're a master, today he would say, whether you're the entry-level employee or the CEO, remember the reality is we all work for one true master, the ultimate, perfect, loving, benevolent master in Jesus Christ. He says, so remember that, regardless of your station and status in life in this world. And then he says, finally, finally, and it brings us to verse 10 in chapter 6. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present, this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil 
in the heavenly places. That's interesting, that last phrase. I didn't really think much about that this week, but the spiritual forces of evil, there are places in the Bible where it says God cast down fallen angels to be among this earth for a while. Isaiah 14 is one of the places. There's other places. But it says there's spiritual forces of evil right now in the heavenly realms as well. And so for a time, there will be spiritual forces of evil that continue to exist. And so we're living in a spiritual realm, not just flesh and blood, not just material, but a spiritual realm. Paul concludes this letter by reminding his readers, that would be the church in Ephesus, today it's the church at Bethany, of the cosmic narrative in which we, as Christ church, we hold an important role in this spiritual realm. Paul describes the battle at work in the spiritual realm, but then he also describes the tools that God gives us to be victorious in battle, to ensure our victory. And so our struggle is not against people. Our struggle is not against people. You know, it's helpful us to remember that our struggle really isn't against people, even though it may seem like the opposition in our lives is coming from people sometimes. And I believe God is giving you and me an, an opportunity this morning. And I think a question is, will you receive it? Will I receive it? You know, our mission statement here is making disciples by helping one another experience the life God offers. To experience the life God offers, you have to receive what God is offering to you. So let me ask you today, is there a person or persons in your life who is making your life difficult, who you find challenging, maybe annoying, maybe irritating, maybe beyond that, maybe truly difficult. Uh, it could be a person at, at your workplace, or it might be at school sometimes. Uh, it could be a, a relative, it could even be a spouse. Um, it could be someone on a sports team or some other venue. It could even be someone, imagine this, someone at church that is just making your life kind of challenging. And God's word, with that in mind, is instructing us to begin to think of this person differently. And, and also, let me mention this morning that the reality is, the truth is, you or I may be that person for someone else. I mean, it's like, oh, wasn't thinking about that. No, 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 no. But yes, 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 that could be. And so what if, what if you and I, what if we take God's word to heart, as difficult as it might be in some situations? Because there are some situations that, I mean, you and I know. It's tough. It's tough as far as the history maybe that's happened. But what if we took those situations and that person and you commit to seeing that person from a new perspective. And we acknowledge, God, I'm gonna need your help to do this because of what he or what she has done or is doing. What if we commit to seeing this person, God willing, from a new perspective, to begin to under and understand and embrace that the person really is not the problem, they're the symptom. We live in a spiritual realm. The spiritual is the problem. And so how do we deal with spiritual matters? Well, that's what Ephesians 6, the end of Ephesians 6 is about. Now, keep in mind what Paul is not saying. He's not saying that if you just pray more, if you just read your Bible more, that this thorn in your side, this pain in your neck, it is going to suddenly be transformed. They'll just be the most wonderful person you ever met, and praise God. I mean, that could happen. But you and I know that sometimes people change, and sometimes uh, they don't, or they don't seem to. You can't control him or her. Who's the one person you can kind of, sort of control what? It's yourself. So what about you? How are you dealing with this relationship? How, how does being a follower of Jesus impact and equip you as you're aware that our struggle is against, Paul says who the struggle's against, the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see, Paul's explaining as God speaks through them, there is an organized spiritual opposition with a plan a plan that they'll continue to execute until Jesus and the fulfillment of God's plan brings it to a close. I mean, thank God 
we can read, and particularly in books like uh, the, the um, books like Revelation, that speak about one day, one day evil will be brought to a close, and it will be no more. But that day hasn't arrived yet. There's organized spiritual opposition with a plan. They'll continue to execute that plan until Jesus brings it to a close. In fact, Jesus spoke of this in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10. John 10, 10. That's, that's kind of my life verse I adapted uh, years ago. And really, I take the second half of the verse. But, but we can't forget the first half. Jesus says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's speaking of the evil one, the devil, Satan. He says, he comes not to just annoy you. It might start with that. But he comes to steal and to kill and to destroy you. He says, but the next part of that verse is this. But I have come. But I came that they may have life they being his followers, his church, the children of God, that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus says, I offer the abundant life, but I tell you, it is in the midst of a spiritual battle right now here on earth. So stick with me. In fact, along with John 10.10, uh, 10, where Jesus is quoted, the, um, the apostle John, who was one of Jesus' closest friends during his time here on earth, he writes in 1 John, that those little those thin books near the end of the Bible, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And 1st John, he's writing to the church, this is John, and he says, you dear children, in chapter 4, verse 4, you dear children are from God and have overcome them. He was speaking about the difficulties, the evils in the spiritual realm. He says, you've overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And he's saying, don't forget that. In fact, one of my mantras, I took this verse and, I don't know, years ago, somebody said to me, remember, Doug, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And I tell you, when life is just going kind of, can we say crappy? Is that, are we allowed? Yeah, kind of bad. Um, I say, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. I mean, lately, um, I'm sure there's situations, uh, those of us gathered here, but man, this morning at 8.30, it was at Barry Mason was on his little uh, roller thing. It says he slipped in his swimming pool and did major damage to his foot and had surgery. We know Shannon has the collarbone that uh, was broken. We have Jan Stevens getting her neck um, repaired Friday. We had uh, Karen Sigmund who just had her hip replaced and she was here at church worshiping for the first time in months because finally she's, she's uh, free from enough pain to come here. And I'm thinking, whew, there's a lot of stuff. There are times in our life, you know, you got that school assignment and you're like, oh, wow, what is this about? Well, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Somehow we'll get through this. But Satan will try to distract us and make us forget that in the midst of life's challenges. To discourage our shoring up for spiritual warfare by getting us focused on people rather than on himself, causing us to miss the target, the source of evil. It's easy to get distracted. I was thinking about this earlier in the week. It's funny how I thought about that. I'm like, I needed a, an illustration for getting distracted. And what do you know, just an hour later, I'm, I'm in a car, when's this Wednesday afternoon, heading to the Reds game. I was invited to go to the Reds game by Justin Gravitt. He works with us from the Navigators. He invited me and two other pastors. And so here you have three kind of extroverted pastors and then Justin Gravitt. And we're, we get to talk and I just met one guy. Somehow, I don't know how, I got to telling this story about, in the, in the house we used to live in, we had a, I, I may have mentioned this before, we had a spotlight in the back, but you had to go like this to get it to trigger. So, I would do, so when my dog went out to go down the stairs and, and do his duty, um, I would go like this and it would trigger. So I'm driving, we're driving in this car and you just got hand gestures going all over the place telling these funny stories. And, and, and it would have been fine if Justin, the introvert, would have been driving, but he wasn't. It was one of the other guys. So he's looking in the rearview mirror as I'm telling this story about waving my hands so the spotlight would come on and my dog can go to the bathroom. And my neighbor in the back sees me waving and he's getting his paper and he looks up and he's like, all right. And anyway, funny story. And, but as he's watching me, he, there's lots of cars on I-75. You may know that. And all of a sudden, one of the other guys go, car! And, and we're like, whoa! And we got there safe and sound. And the Reds won, which is good. But I, I don't know a lot about baseball. First inning, though, two infielders, 
bam, run into each other. And it was I'm like, oh man, I've, I've heard this team struggles. But then what, four home runs and we, who we beat, who we play. I'm such a baseball guy. St. Louis Cardinals, there you go. It was fun. Lots in life that can get us distracted, right? There's thousands of examples. You can thank God. I'm not going to tell you any more of mine. But, uh, <laughs> but the evil one likes to distract followers of Jesus from the mission to which we've been called. And so this morning, let's briefly consider how God offers to equip us so that we can focus on the things that God wants us to be about, especially when times are challenging. He says in verse 13, uh, chapter 6, 13, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. Let's just take a look at these. Because we're going to be strong in the Lord. We've got to put on this armor, but God's, God's battles are different. God's battles are often fought on our knees. He says what? We, we have these things that uh, God offers us in order for us to stand strong in the midst of life. God wants us to have joy and peace and love. But he acknowledges. The scriptures tell us, but I haven't promised you that this life's going to be easy for now. We're on a journey to one day be in a kingdom together. We're not there yet. So he gives us, it's interesting, mostly defensive armor. First of all, the belt of truth. And I've, I put some Bible verses I, on the YouVersion, um, what is it, YouVersion app, the Bible app. I mentioned those as well. And we're not gonna read through all those. Basically, Bible verses that say, you know what, you gotta shore yourself up. Be surrounded, what, with truth. Secondly, as you have that truth, put on that breastplate that protects your heart that breastplate of righteousness. In other words, as you live your life, do the right thing. Not always the popular thing, do the right thing. Third, have the shoes for readiness. First Peter 3.15 basically says, I'm still working on memorizing it, but it says, always be prepared to give an account for the, uh, well, that's where I get messed up, but for the joy that you have. Basically, why as the why you believe in Christ. Peter's saying, being ready. And, you know, even as a pastor, I found how can I be ready to share with someone about Christ? One of the things I'm working on now is a 90-second, what do you call it, elevator speech? A 90-second elevator speech as to why I believe in Christ, what Christianity is about, and how God offers that to you. Because I, 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 get, you know, I have a lot of conversations, but if someone, I mean, what if I went around and said, okay, you, come up this morning on the stage, 90 seconds, share with us the gospel, what's it about? I mean, would you ever go, uh, Wow, I mean, I, mean, I, I know, but I, but I don't feel ready. And so God's just telling us, well, it's okay. Well, then practice, be, be ready. Because you never know when you might have that opportunity to share about Jesus Christ. And he's just saying, just be ready. Be ready to share about it. So right now I'm working with, um, actually with Mike Finfrock. And I said, hey, let's put together, let's practice our 90-second sharing of the gospel uh, and, and it feels weird sometimes at home, but I'll, you know, I'll just be in a bedroom or in my office and I'll just say, I'll just pretend there's a person there or my dogs. I'll say, all right, I'm going to share with you about the gospel. And you dogs need to know this anyway, because I'm tired of you chewing on the chairs and laying on my chair, on my couch and, and, but, um, and so I'll share the gospel. And, and seriously, I encourage you to do the same. So far what I've done, I took a sheet of paper. I said, how have I experienced Christ and God's love? What are the milestone moments in my life? And I just wrote them down. And I'm going to take those now and, and kind of leave some out, put some in, and just shape it and just practice 90 seconds. I mean, that's not the only answer, but it's one way. Why am I doing this? I want to be more ready for when I'm at, the, at my golf league or the other places I encounter non-Christians to share, this is why, this is why I follow Jesus. So that's what, that's what Paul's saying. God wants us to be ready. Next, he says the shield of faith. There's going to be a lot of stuff coming at you. So you need to have that faith. So that when the stuff comes at you, you're like, nah, they told me this would happen. And so I still got my faith. 
Helmet of salvation is the last one defensively. The helmet, of course, the head controls the body. The salvation, it's where it begins. It's like the control center coming to Christ as Savior. That's got to be the, the starting point. And, the, and Christ then uh, directs the rest of your life. And then there's one offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit. And Paul, and I'm thankful he says this, he says the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When I heard the sword of the Spirit, I was reminded, um, I've heard this phrase at times where leaders in churches and other situations say, let's all, let's pray in the Spirit. Uh, years ago, about 20 years ago, I was at this seminar. It was a great seminar. But that was the first time I'd, I'd first-hand experience where they, there were about 40 of us there. They go, okay, now, as we, we sang a praise song. They go, now let's, let's pray or sing in the Spirit. And I wasn't familiar with that phrase. What that meant was, let's pray or sing in tongues, is what it meant. And, um, and so people, I was like, what? And, and so people around me start doing, you know, they're, they're speaking in tongues, they're singing in tongues. It was kind of quiet, and there was quiet music. It was really pretty cool, I have to say. And when I get in situations where I'm like, Lord, this is new, this is new, uh, I guess I need to find out more about this. And so I've studied, and yeah, tongues are a gift from God. Not everybody speaks in tongues, some people do. It's a way to glorify God, and it's fine. And so they have this phrase, let's pray in the Spirit. And so, so I don't want to take that away, because I, I thank God for my charismatic brothers and sisters. And that being said, I'm not saying God can't give the gifts of tongue or miraculous healing to a bunch of Methodists. That could happen as well. But, but I just pointed out this morning because Paul says the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And then he says, pray at all times in the Spirit. So to me, he's saying, pray at all times in the Word of God. And I'm like, all right, we can do that. Let me give you an example. There's millions of examples. One would be at the end of Matthew 28. Matthew 28, where Jesus says, go into all the world, you know, making disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says what? And lo, I will be with you always, right? So what if your prayer life took the word of God and said, and you prayed something like this, Jesus, I trust you and I need you. You said you'll be with me always. So I'm trusting you're with me now. And that being the case, I've got some things happening today in which I need your strength and wisdom. So I thank you in advance for being with me. Help me to be faithful to you. Amen. Amen. May you and I be people that pray in the Spirit, the Spirit being the Word of God. Um, there's just no substitute for Bible knowledge combined with the, the saving love of Jesus and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's how we live as disciples and we make disciples. And that's what we're about. Live as a disciple, make disciples. I mean, think about it. Every disciple for Jesus that's made is one less possibility for the enemy. And who's the enemy? Who's the enemy? I mean, hear me carefully this morning. How did we begin? We said we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And Paul said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. You know, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we're called to love all people, all people, no exceptions. The people, whoever they are, they're not our enemy. We're called to love all. People have been, like you and me, created by God, made in his sacred image. Every person's a potential disciple of Jesus. But there is an enemy, and he has a variety of names. What, Satan, the devil, the evil one. I know those of you who are old enough to have seen Saturday Night Live back in the day, that church lady thing, and she'd rattle us off. Satan's son, you know, Satan. Son. And I recognize some non-believers consider this kind of silly or fairy tales or fantasy, but Jesus didn't. Jesus repeatedly and fully recognized and taught that we're in a spiritual battle with spiritual beings, fallen angels, no longer in the heavenly courts of God the Father, cast down to earth, permitted for a time to have authority, limited authority, as God permits, and impact the lives of people on earth. The devil, whose, whose biggest weapon is, is the fear of death, and that's been defeated on the cross. 
The devil who will one day be eternally defeated, no longer permitted to steal, kill, and destroy. So in the meantime, in the meantime, we're to stay strong. Paul says, stand. After you've done everything else, stand. Figuratively speaking. Spiritually speaking, at least. In spite of our weaknesses and our mess-ups, in the midst of spiritual struggle, we're to stay standing. And if we stay faithful and we stand strong, we're victorious with Jesus and with his people. You know, perfection isn't the goal, but being faithful is. So this morning, I urge you to be spiritually equipped. We're all on a journey. Some have traveled with Christ longer than others, but we're all, we are all where we are. So let me just urge you to know God's word and to pray, 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 and to encourage one another. Well, Paul wraps it up this way, and this is kind of how we're going to wrap it up too. He wraps it up with a request. He basically says, pray for each other, and then he says, and please pray for me. He puts it this way in verses 18 to 20. He says, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. In other words, pray for each other. And also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. I think Paul's saying, don't think for a second that I find this easy as far as going into these cities, some that have never heard of Jesus Christ. Others may have known the Israelites and the Jewish faith. But now he says, and I'm telling about the, the salvation. In Ephesus, he had, to some, he had to communicate the gospel of Jesus while maintaining relationship with people who were devoted to a pagan goddess. And so he's saying, pray for me. And verse 20, he says, for which I am an ambassador in chains. It's gotten me into trouble that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. You know, why is it vital that you're strong in the Lord? Because God is calling a people, an army, and he'll, he'll extend that invitation to anybody, but not all receive God's call. I mean, this is personal. If you've received the gift of salvation in Jesus, you've been equipped to love God and to love one another, and you've been drafted into the, the army, so to speak, to do battle against evil and make disciples for Jesus. I mean, that's what we're about. And so this morning, as we do each week, we're going to close this time in prayer. I want to focus on a couple things this morning. One is that God would and will equip us as Paul described, and we'd be willing to receive and, and work uh, and receive God's grace to, to be equipped. And then secondly, this morning, I want to pray, I want you to think of a person by name to pray for that has or is making your life difficult. And this morning, God would open the eyes of our hearts to see this person in a new light. You know, Peter asked Jesus, Lord, how many times are we supposed to forgive someone? What, seven times? You remember what Jesus said, what? No, not seven, but seven times 70. In other words, you never stop. But it can be hard. God wants us to be equipped and to be free of bitterness. And so let's pray this morning as we, um, thank you, God, for keeping my iPad going. Let's pray for these things. And if y'all want to pray uh, in your seat or if you want to come to the kneeling rail, yeah, we're, we're, I and we are striving to be intentional about taking a few minutes each time we gather on Sunday to pray. And, you know, two minutes maybe, maybe two and a half, I don't know. And so that's why we have these kneeling rails out every week. And I know there's some level of awkwardness as you go through the transition phase of, in a culture of explaining this. But I just, my prayer is that Praying will just be natural to you. And if you want to kneel, or if you want to stand and raise your hands, or if you want to lay on the floor, or if you just want to be in the chair, it's all good. Because what do we do? We pray together. So let's pray. Let's pray. God, as we come to you here today, I thank you, Lord, that you speak to people like the Apostle Paul. And you use him as an instrument of grace to teach and share and set an example. And and today, Lord, as he wrote to this church long ago, I believe, Lord, you're speaking through him to, to speak to us. Lord, we do live in, a, in the spiritual realm. 
It's not difficult to see that evil exists in this world. We wish it didn't, but it does. And so this morning, Lord, I pray, I pray that each one of us here will first have received the gift of forgiveness and salvation in Jesus Christ. That as Will spoke of, and we've already sung, that God, as, as the starting point in relationship with God, says, here's my son. He gave his life to pay for all the evil that you have done or will do. So Lord Jesus, may each one of us here have received you as Savior. And then Lord, this, this armor of God that Paul speaks of, help us Lord speak the truth according to your word. Help us Lord to ext extend righteousness, to do and think what's right and act in a right way. Lord, help us to be ready to share about who you are and our relationship with you and why we follow Jesus. Lord, help us with that helmet of salvation as you guide us and to have the sword of the Spirit that we would extend the word of God always in love for others. Make us to be the people, Lord, you'd have us be. That evil would be overcome and love and goodness would prevail. And finally this morning, I want to take just a moment that each of us here would lift up a person by name. It might be a difficult uh, boss or coworker. It might be a fellow student that we think of. Maybe somebody on one of our sports teams. It might be a family member. It could be an, uh, a spouse or an ex-spouse. Or this morning, wash away the bitterness, the resentment, the desire for vengeance. We acknowledge that there have been many things done that were wrong and evil and abusive. We don't lighten that or wash that away. As far as what was wrong was wrong. But today we do come and we believe, Lord, that with your help, your grace can help wash that away in the sense of freeing us, Lord, from thinking of this person in a, in a harmful or malicious way. Lord, this morning, these people we're thinking of by name, I pray that we would pray for each one, that you would bless them, that you would bless them, Lord, and help them to know you. Thank you, God, for never giving up on us and help us to never give up on one another. Jesus, we pray these things in your holy name. We give you thanks.